<clears throat> Jeremiah had been commanded by God to preach repentance to the people of Judah, turn their hearts away from the wicked things that Adam spoke of just a few moments ago. And thus far in that commission, he has faithfully charged, uh, carried out his duties, and he's already, in the few years he's been preaching, seen a number of injustices. He himself has faced a number of terrible trials, even from his own family, which leads Jeremiah the prophet to ask the age-old question in verse 1, Jeremiah 12, verse 1. Righteous art thou, O Lord, that I would plead my case with thee. Indeed, I would discuss matters of justice with thee. Why has the way of the wicked prospered? And why are all those who deal in treachery at ease? Have you ever made such a plaintive cry? In all likelihood, you have, I believe, all children of God at some point will ask a question like this maybe several times in your life. Why do the righteous sometimes suffer and the wicked seem to prosper? If you've ever asked that question, I want you to understand that you're in very good company. A company that obviously includes Jeremiah, includes Job, includes Asaph, it includes Gideon, David, and a host of others, Habakkuk. And the Bible, I believe, in large measure, answers the question. But right now, at this time in Jeremiah's life, God is more concerned about the spiritual stamina of his prophet. Jeremiah, even at this early portion of his ministry, is showing signs of despondency. He's already showing a spiritual weariness that God's concerned about. And so God, in the form of a question, admonishes Jeremiah in verse 5. Jeremiah 12 in verse 5. He says, if you have run with footmen and they've tired you out, how can you compete with horses? If you fall down in a land of peace, Jeremiah, how are you going to do in the thicket of the Jordan? And so, Jeremiah, if you're already limping along, if, if you're right now struggling in a relative time of peace, then how's it going to be when trials escalate? There have been a lot of trials, but they're going to become greater. So Jeremiah, how are you going to deal with the situation when Nebuchadnezzar sweeps down that Jordan Valley and he destroys the walls of your temple and he destroys the city and he destroys your temple and he kills thousands of people that you've known intimately all of your life? You'll see that happen. And uh, most of the remainder will be taken back into Captivity. How are you going to deal with that if you're already limping along? And so the, the principle, I think, is pretty clear here. And that is, I want you to be prepared. I want you to be ready when trials come. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And how are you going to deal with these trials when they come? And God says, I've given you all the tools, and I will continue to provide for you, Jeremiah, as he will for all of us, because trials come into the lives of all saints. And so God reassures Jeremiah in this chapter and in the following chapters, Jeremiah, I am trustworthy. You trust me because I'm trustworthy. And I will give you the strength you need to endure. And I will give you perspective to understand, to make sense of the suffering. 
because a lot of times it doesn't make sense. And I will give you hope so that you will persevere. That's the message he gives to Jeremiah over and over again as Jeremiah is carrying out this very difficult task to his own people. Now with that lodged in our mind, that principle, we must be prepared for trials because it's not a question of if, but when and how. And the how is God. God is able. God provides all we need and he's trustworthy. Let's look now at James teaching on this in chapter one, please. James chapter one. And beginning there in verse 2. <clears throat> in James 1 and verse 2. If there was ever a paradoxical statement, it's what James says here in verse 2. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials but not so paradoxical when you look at verse three. Knowing the testing of your faith produces endurance. Let endurance have its perfect result that you may be perfect, complete lacking in nothing. And so James says, here is the joy. It's not obviously in the trial itself. Nobody enjoys the trial, the hardship, the struggle, the affliction. No one enjoys that in of itself. There's nothing to enjoy there. But what God is saying is, I want you to look beyond the, the experience to the fruit that can come from it. And whether or not it does is up to you and me. So I want you to look ahead. Look beyond the hardship to the growth, to the maturity in other words, I want you to view this trial from my perspective, the Lord says, from a heavenly perspective. And stop looking at it on a horizontal plane, because on a horizontal plane, we want out of those trials as quickly as we possibly can, and they don't make any sense. But when you view them from God's perspective, and you say, okay, trials are necessary from that perspective, because the greatest qualities of which a human being is capable are only possible when we're trying. Now, God's word teaches us to have love, but how are you going to have love if all you do is read about it? You have to be tried. You have to prove that love. It has to become shoe leather. It has to become active because that's what agape love is, active goodwill. Unconditional. How are you and I going to grow in patience if somebody doesn't try our patience? You see the point? That has to happen. There's no way we can grow in mercy unless we show mercy. There's no way I can be compassionate unless I am compassionate. All of those things require a testing. A trying. You know, I, I want to become meek, and so I can't just look at a vine's expository dictionary and look up the word meekness and say, okay, this is gentle, forbearing spirit. I'm meek. I, I understand what it means now, perhaps, but until I show that gentle, forbearing spirit that may suffer wrong and not become resentful, I'm not meek. I have to be tried. And so you see why the Lord in his infinite wisdom says, it's a good thing. It's hard. No question about it. It's hard. But it's not without purpose. God gives perspective to trials. And only he can do that. Only God can give it purpose. And we need to trust in him in that regard. And number one, first and foremost, God is trustworthy. He's trustworthy, he's proven. He has a great track record. He's always proven himself trustworthy.
So once we have these two twin truths cemented in our heart, number one, the Lord says we must be prepared for trials, that we need to be ready for them because it's not a question of if and when and how we will deal with it. And the how is God. And then James says that trials can be good if we view them from heaven's perspective and we pray and ask God for the wisdom to help us do that. He'll say that in verse 45 of James 1. And so with his wisdom, with his help, from our trustworthy God, we have the strength, we have perspective, we have the hope we need to persevere. We can have the qualities that God wants us to have and grow in those qualities. With those two twin truths now, we're ready to look at Paul's teaching in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, where God says, here are three reasons I want you to endure trial. Look at 2 Corinthians 1 with me now. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians is a very personal letter of the Apostle Paul. And uh, in this letter, he bears his soul. He speaks freely of his own suffering, his own trial. There are at least 10 different Greek words for suffering in the New Testament. Paul uses five of them in this letter. And if you were to take a red marker and mark all the words that are comparable to suffering in this letter, you find red marks in nearly every page. Paul bears his soul here because he wants these saints to understand how much he loves them. I love you this much. I'm willing to suffer for you. As Adam pointed out, freedom isn't free. It's costly. It costs our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the ultimate price, and terrible suffering on the cross. And the Apostle Paul, his servant, eventually martyred him as well. Let's read what <clears throat> Paul says in verse 3 here about uh, trials. Putting it in heaven's perspective. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of mercies, God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction, with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. Notice that word comfort used a great deal here. It helps us understand the context and its main purpose. It's used 10 times in five verses. Same Greek word. The word means to go alongside. Go alongside. In my Bible, I've underlined it so I can just be reminded of the fact that God doesn't always take away the trial, whatever it may be, but neither will God go away. The trial may stay with me, but so will the Lord, and he's greater than any trial I have to face. God is greater. He's bigger. How big is your God? My God's bigger than any trial I may face, and he'll be with me all the way, helping me to endure whatever that trial may be. So the word comfort here, God is alongside. If you have any kind of marker or pen or pencil with you, I want you to take it out right now. If you have it in your purse, in your pocket, take out a pen or pencil. You may not have it. If you got one handy there in the pew, I want you to pick it up, please. And I want you to do something. And, and, and what I'm asking you to do, of course, you'll see in a moment, but I believe it's something that will be of great help to you for many, many years to come. Here's what I, I'm asking you to do. Take that marker, that pen, or that pencil. Circle, highlight, or underline these words here. First of all, in verse 4, I want you to under, underline the words, that or so that, who comforts us in our affliction, so that, if you would highlight, underline the word so that, and you may put number one there. 
number one. That's the first reason God wants us to endure trials. And then in verse 9, Indeed, we have the sentence of death within ourselves. And if you would, underline or circle, highlight, in order that, in order that, or so that, there's the second reason why the Holy Spirit says we need to endure trials. And then in verse 11, you also joining in helping us through your prayers, that, if you would, underline, highlight, circle, that, there's the third reason, Thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the favor bestowed upon us through the prayers of many. So here are three reasons given by the Lord himself for his people to endure trials. Let's look at each one of them now in turn. Number one, verse four. God who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. And so number one reason is so we can be prepared to help others and comfort others with the comfort and knowledge and help we've received from the Lord. Who can best understand what it's like to sit beside a parent a child, a friend, a brother, a sister in need. Maybe it's sickness. Maybe it's depression, discouragement. Who can best understand what that is like? Maybe someone's going through a serious disease, and you're with them going through that process all the way maybe to the last breath, which some of you have done. Who can best understand what that's like than the one who itself has gone through that experience, wrapped in the blanket of God's grace, given the strength that God gives, the perspective that God can give, the hope that God can give. That's the person who's especially effective in helping other people. And that's what Paul's talking about here. Paul is saying, I can be of great comfort to you because God has been of great comfort to me in similar ways. Who can best understand what it's like to experience the heartache of an adulterous wife or an adulterous husband, but someone who's gone through that experience themselves wrapped in the blanket of God's grace? I remember years ago, a dear sister whose husband was unfaithful to her, admitted his unfaithfulness on a number of occasions. And after she had gone through that heartache, a few months later, here was another sister in Christ in the same congregation whose husband was unfaithful to her. Many people sought to comfort her and help her through this experience, but who do you think was especially helpful to that sister during that time? The one who had been through that experience wrapped in the blanket of God's grace. Who can best understand what it's like to experience to go through and experience the heavy burden of rebellious children who refuse to have God in their lives. Who can best understand what it's like to face the anguish and the pain of an alcoholic spouse or an alcoholic parent? But the person who's gone through that experience themselves. Others can certainly help. We show compassion. We try to put ourselves in that situation to the best of our ability, and, and definitely there will be help with prayer and what we can say or do. But those individuals who have been through that, the point of the Apostle Paul, are especially effective. And how gracious and good it is, brother and sister, to use that experience. Let the Lord use you as an instrument to be helpful in many ways, but especially for someone who's going through a similar experience or trial that you've been through. The Lord will use you greatly. Don't bury that experience you've had in the ground. Let the Lord use you to help somebody else in that situation and in other situations. Similar experience, experiences create a mutual 
understanding and strong bond of love. And it's one reason the Holy Spirit says we go through trials so that we may be able to be of comfort to other people who are facing a similar experience. The second reason the Apostle Paul gives here, let's, uh, let's read verse 8 through 10 here, 2 Corinthians 1. We do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired even of life. I wish we knew more about Paul's experience in Asia, but we do know from his statement here, even this great soldier of the cross was pushed to pushed to the very brink of despair. Verse 9, he says, here's the reason. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves. Paul thought he was going to die. In order that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. And so the second reason God says we, we go through trials is so that we may learn to not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Now you think about the Apostle Paul, this strong soldier of the cross. You think he, he didn't need to learn to trust in the Lord anymore. He's already very, very mature. And yet God sends this thorn in the flesh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And yet here's an experience in Asia Paul doesn't go into detail about. He just mentions it to let them know, that's how much I love you. We're willing to go through these kind of things for you and for the Lord. He says, the reason that happened, I know, is because it helped me to trust in the Lord even more. Well, if the Apostle Paul can learn to trust in the Lord even more, that means Dempsey Collins can learn to trust in the Lord even more, no matter where I am on the spiritual plane. How about you? As strong a person as Abraham was, that great trial of offering his son Isaac you know, there in Genesis chapter 22 came late, later on in his life. I mean, he's a faithful servant of the Lord. And yet here's this trial. And even Abraham, Father Abraham, can learn to trust in the Lord even more. And how about Job? An amazing Servant of the Lord. Chapter 31, you know, makes me uneasy when I read chapter 31. We talk about Proverbs 31 and the, the virtuous uh, woman there. Don't ever teach that without teaching Job 31 and what Job says about his own life. It's an amazing, godly life. This good man shows great reverence for the Lord in every respect. And yet even Job could learn to trust in the Lord even more. And so if Paul, if Abraham, if Job certainly Dempsey comes. Someone one time said, pain plants the flag of reality in the fortress of a stubborn heart. Trials sometimes ferret out the pride. They clean out the doubt and the fear that may be there. Trials help us remember how weak, how fragile we truly are, how dependent we are on the Lord. We're not the self-made, self-sufficient person. We thought we were far from it. Every breath, every heartbeat is dependent on the Lord. Rather than fight and struggle with faith when trials come, we need to do as the psalmist said, cease your striving and know that he is God. Psalm 46, verse 10. And then Psalm 119, this gem of wisdom, verse 17, it was good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn thy ways, that I may learn to trust in thee. I remember lying in a hospital bed for two weeks in my young life. And I can, I can tell you with a plain conscience before God, it was good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn. There are some lessons learned on the mountaintops of life. Well, I want to tell you, many of the, the great lessons we learn in life are often learned in the valleys. When we're on our back, forced to look up. It was good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn my ways. 
Sometimes we think we trust in the Lord plenty. God knows best. So that we would not trust in ourselves, Paul says, but in the Lord who raises the dead. Third reason, Paul says, we need to go through trials for Salem. You also joining in, helping us through your prayers. That, here's the reason, that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the favor bestowed upon us through the prayers of the many. I think this is the most mature reason of all for enduring trials. And, and until, you know, we've grappled with and accepted the first two, we're not ready to accept the third one here. In this statement of faith in verse 11, Paul is looking beyond his own mere preservation, his own life, to the great help, whatever the situation is, the great help it will be for other saints and the glory that God will receive as a result of it. And so in the third reason, we are definitely looking beyond ourselves to whatever lesson we may learn from it, to how you can benefit from our perseverance. Whatever endurance, whatever faith you're manifesting during that trial, you're thinking of the others because it will help them and it will give glory to God. And when Paul reported this kind of news to the Corinthians, I want you to know this is what happened in Asia. We despaired of life. We came to the brink of death. When he, when he spoke of that to these saints and other saints, what God had done for them, what he's saying is a great chorus of praise went up to God from these Corinthian saints and for all the saints that do this. Because God's love, his grace, his kindness, his mercy, was clearly manifested and Paul's great example of faith was also seen and, and we need that too. We need people with skin on them to show great faith as well as trust in the Lord. The point is, enduring trials is not only for ourselves, but it leads others to praise and glorify God. There's no greater service that you and I can render in this life than seeking the glory of God. And sometimes that means suffering for, for him. So the faith of others can be stronger and God will be glorified. And that's the ultimate end, the glory of God. Remember Paul's teaching in Philippians chapter 1. And Paul says in verse 12 to the Philippian saints, he says, you know, brethren, I know you're concerned about me and I know that you're anxious about me but I want you to know my imprisonment for the cause of Christ has turned out for the greater good. Because in this imprisonment, I've had opportunity to actually preach to people that I would not have had opportunity to preach to, the Praetorian God, the special God. And so I don't want you to be concerned about me. I want you to thank God for this opportunity he's provided for me. You see the same thing when he's in Philippi, you know, he's in prison, they shut him up in a prison in an inner cell in Philippi. Shut him up like a bird in a cage, and he sang his sweetest song. A song of praise, a song of faith to God. And that example, you see, helped Jacob and all those other prisoners listening. They must have been amazed at that. Who does that? Who sings songs of praise to God when they've been beaten unmercifully with rods and put in an inner rat-infested prison? Something's different about that guy. Whatever he has, that's what I want. That's what the jailer decided. Whatever you got, I want that. You're different. The kingdom only attracts when it's different. We need to be different from the world. And this is one way we're different in the way we handle trials. Not grumbling and complaining, careful, but trusting because God is trustworthy. Because God will give perspective. God will give strength. God gives hope. And so there's no victories without battles, no peaks without valleys. 
no endurance without struggle, no patience without hardship, no completeness without trials and growth. Because of the Apostle Paul's teaching here, we can say confidently that trials hurt, they're painful, but they're not without purpose. Through these trials, God is accomplishing his purpose. Number one, he's preparing us to be of comfort to other people with what we learn. Secondly, he's teaching us to trust in him more, and we can all do that. And third, he's using us to strengthen and build up the faith of others as they see our example. To God be all the glory. Somebody has well said, when the shore is won at last, who will count all the storms and bills of the past? When we get to heaven's shore, none of us are going to look back and say, well, was it worth it? Look at all the trials. Look at this. Look at that. We endured. You think the Apostle Paul would ever think something like that? These saints now with their Lord. We won't look at the billows past. We'll just praise God forever and ever for the joys of heaven. Heaven's worth everything or nothing's worth anything. As our brother pointed out earlier, Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example to follow. Christ suffered. Hebrews 5, 8, though he was a son, he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. Christ suffered. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. It was a shameful thing, but he endured it for the hope set before him. Setting us an example, and we will too. We will too, because God is trustworthy. He puts it all in perspective for us. He makes sense of that suffering for us. We need to trust in Him. Are you ready to do that this morning if you haven't already? We invite you to come as we stand and sing the song selected.